Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to the Squawk Out Podcast. It's Joel Benavides, and the time is 5.06 p.m. on the 30th of October, 2020. Uh, Bitcoin currently trading at $13,579 even, and the U.S. presidential election weighs on. Uh, I'm joined tonight by uh, ham radio operator, amateur radio operator, uh, political enthusiast, and uh, cellist, uh, John Stewart. Uh, John, are you with us? Yes. Hello, how are you, Joel? Good, good, good. Uh, do me a favor, John, and just uh, kind of introduce yourself. Uh, tell me, tell me about how we met, and uh, and and we can go from there. How we met? I believe the first time you and I had a kiso was a few years back on two meter radio, and uh, it was an active time, and uh, there was. A lot of political discussion. There, uh, there was also uh, just discussions over the rules of ham radio, uh, and so if, if I'm not mistaken, that's the first place that we met. Is that correct, Joel? Yeah, yeah. I think we had a a, a few uh, Q. You mentioned QSO. For those listeners or people who will listen to this, who don't know what a QSO is. A QSO is basically like a like a communication, a contact that is carried out and logged over over amateur radio or ham radio. Um, I guess we should lay the foundation for ham radio for somebody who doesn't even know what ham radio is. What, what, how would you explain that to, a, to a, 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 an Elmer or a, somebody who's a, not an Elmer, somebody who's like just completely? Yeah, that's a really interesting question because I think that that leads to some of the division and some of the conflict that exists within radio. Uh, I think there's a segment, and I, ca- I count myself as part of this population, that believes that ham radio or amateur radio is a hobby and one that should be inclusive, and we want to bring as many people in as possible, and it's a beautiful form of communication. It's, in essence, magic, right? Uh, yeah. Whereas another segment of the population believes that it's a tool to an end, uh, that it's politicized, I would even say militarized, uh, you know, you might find, uh, you know, someone that's a, a, a prepper or a doomer more inclined to be in this. And, you know, they're, they're, they look at the protocol and the various uh, rules and regulations as, you know, all important. Uh, I believe we should follow the spirit of the law, not necessarily the letter of the law. Would you agree with that? Um, the spirit of the law. How do you, well, I mean, wh- how would you distinguish between the spirit of the law and, and- of the law. I've never heard that that said. Right. Let me let me give you an example of this. And 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 I actually got a a, a quote unquote love letter from the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, on this. Well, I I, I do uh, want to cover that, and I'm definitely going to bring that up because I I when I looked you up earlier, I saw a little bit of that online. I was like, I just typed into Google KD5 RDY, and and up, up it came. But, and so I'm definitely going to bring that up. I won't forget. But just to kind of put a period here, basically ham radio is usage of two-way radios on different frequencies that are allocated by the government in order for people to have a, have a, have a conversation. And, and it's old, right? This, is like, this goes back to like the, the inception of radio period where people were, were doing hobbies and and having communicate, having having transatlantic communications even uh, back in the day over radio, and it was it was something fun to do, right? It was a hobby. 
Absolutely. And, you know, it is a hobby. And, a, and I think that that's the, the, the main driver of it that should be. Um, so, but it is, you know, it is politicized. And, 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 and what I think what you mean by that is there are a lot of, shall we say, right wing people associated with the, with the ham radio community. Is that accurate? You know, it's interesting because I think that you, you will find a vocal minority on, on, you know, on that side. Um, you know, if you were to take a poll of most amateur radio operators and ask them what their political affiliation or their life view is, their, their philosophy, it probably runs the gamut. But I, I do think that you find certain groups that are more, more vocal within ham radio than uh, than others especially uh, that especially that non uh non repeater uh kind of uh direct vhf uh what's the word i'm looking for it's been a minute uh, it's a qso you know it's like uh it's not you where, where you're not utilizing repeaters where the the, the kind of preppers that believe that they're not going to be able to rely on an electrical grid so they're not counting on repeaters so they're trying to get their radio setups to do point F or, or HF communication. It's that, it's that kind of that survivalist prepper group of folks, I think. Right? Listen, that, I mean, Joel, I mean, I, I think that there's something to be said with being prepared. You know, I've got a little bit of extra food and, you know, um, you know, especially with the pandemic coming up. And, and, I, and I think that there's a certain amount of resources that should be allocated towards preparing for, an emergency situation. But in my opinion, that can't be the default mode of operation is the hunker down attitude. And so that's where I kind of ran into issues on ham radio is that I believe that we have to be forward thinking. We have to be progressive in what we do uh, and we have to plan and prepare for the future. And this rather passive waiting, uh, you know, waiting for the the bad times to come this is not really the american way in my opinion so i see I mean, where you're going with a this philosophical i like that difference there's you know between me and what you would call the prepper movement because i mean look there's nothing wrong with having some extra food but once that's done i think maybe to get out and know our neighbors would be more uh, beneficial you know when i'm walking down the street i try to give people smiles and to you know increase the 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 good vibe that's out there and you know uh, that we're good neighbors to each other and i think that's sometimes where this movement falls short in my opinion it, is it 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 does a good job of preparing but it doesn't do a good job of advancing does that make sense yeah yeah that's interesting uh the uh have you ever seen going along these same lines have you ever seen that movie with uh, i can't think of the guy's name uh from entourage he plays in a, a movie with kind of a, a, a bunch of like left-wing preppers, um, academics. Uh, it's called uh, Goodbye World. And so in the... No, go ahead. Sorry. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, it, well, in this movie, there were a bunch of like left-wing academics. They were like prof mathematics professors at Harvard and stuff like that. And they just, they kind of did the prepper thing. They had like a cabin, extra food, antibiotics in a fridge, you know, stuff like that. And, um, and, and I just thought it was interesting. And I, I don't know if I thought of you specifically when I saw that, but it's so rare because you always see that right wing persuasion associated with those. And so when you say that there are, uh, I, I guess, like social imperatives that are missing from the, the the right wing thing. I think that's a really beautiful view and one that I haven't really encountered before. I th I think I've thought about it, but I haven't really associated like uh so like social imperatives and uh, the things you outlined. You know, being good to your neighbor, uh, uh, being a good neighbor, stuff like that, associated with the prepper thing. That's kind of new to me. Um, do you think? Uh, do you think that that's something that you came to on your own or did you get inspiration from? Um, yeah, I mean, as far as, you know, you look at the word conservative, it, it has a more, um, passive feel to it. I mean, to conserve, uh, and 
it's it's more of an observation that I've made over the years and just looking at what it where the attention goes into, you know, let's take for example the precious metals market, gold and silver. We've seen rallies in both of those, along with cryptocurrency as well, Bitcoin. Uh, and I think that one of the problems that I have with this, it's almost pre pre it's almost like uh expecting this sort of dollar demise. And, you know, it's like, I think it's good, again, it's good to be prepared. You know, I think most financial strategists or advisors would say to hold like 10% of your wealth outside of the stock market, which is taking tumbles these days. Uh, But, you know, what happens when that becomes the bulk asset, when it becomes the major asset? Well, you know, you, you have people cheering on against the system, against the dollar in some way. And so I think it sets up this almost this conflict of interest. You know, I have friends that buy, for example, gold and silver. And, you know, I mentioned to them, you know, the biggest producers of gold and silver in the world today are China and Russia. You know, we're basically buying metal from our enemies. And then the whole time talking smack about the USD. I mean, you know, I think that we have to be very careful moving forward because I think when the economy starts to shrink, you you know, and depending on who gets in power, there's going to be clear lines drawn between who's quote unquote patriotic and who's not. And they're going to look at investments, you know, for example, tax evasion will become a bigger deal moving forward in this economy. There's a lot of money that's being offshored. There's a chance we could be looking at at a reset here of the dollar. Well, I was thinking, the, like right now, as you were explaining all that, I was thinking there's there's a chance that the whole thing would be reset. You know, like I mean, I don't want to jump too quickly into that kind of uh, uh, fatalist thinking, where you know I'm just gonna screaming that the sky is falling. But um, it really does seem that as we move towards a global society and a global economy. Um, the 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 protests and the uh, the voices of opposition are going to slowly come to be organized on a global level, and so we might see things like the Tea Party manifest, but on a global level. You know, like how would you, you know, what you you kind of hinted at it right there. It's like people are going to have to, you know, people who are upset at the way the, the system is running is going to they're going to have to start looking at these offshore accounts and and tax evasion, stuff like that. Um, and, and, and maybe a modern day tea party, globalist tea party thing could emerge out of that. But yeah, I mean, I see where you're going with it. Point. Well, I mean, I, I think that the tea party will become unpopular moving forward to be quite frank with you. I, I, I didn't mean that the political movement tea party, I meant like the actual tea party back in the 1700s, <laughs> like, you oh, know, like, oh like a protest where you're like, this sucks. We're not getting any representation on this system. You know, let's screw, let's, let's chunk a bunch of uh, shipping containers into the sea or something, you know? Well, no, I mean, you know, it's, there's going to be moving forward a great need from, from the people, you know, the economy is slowing down and um, you know, there's, there's real pain and suffering going on here in, in San Antonio and, around the world, maybe more so overseas. And, you know, it, it, it's going to be an imperative that there is more equality. You, you look at the rising stars within the Democratic Party, like Cortez, uh, the congresswoman from the Bronx. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you know, that's really a snapshot of the future. And, you know, I, for, for good and for bad, I mean, many of her policies I agree on. Um, you know, will there be an, an overzealous overreach from the left wing, it's possible, but you know, given the, the the dynamic, the political dynamic today, I think it would be reined in at some point. Uh, you know, more more often than not, we're going to see gridlock in Washington on a political level. So you know, it's like this could be a, this election is not only presidential, as you know. I mean, the Senate is also in the balance as well. I mean, we could look at a blue wave, uh, and uh, I would be for that. I think that that would be a good thing. Uh, especially where we're going. And, you know, my feeling on politics varies depending on the situation. And what Absolutely. I mean by that is what I mean is that in, when and in times are good, basically what we say to the government is, hey, we'll take care of this. We got it. Just don't tax us very much. 
But when times are bad, like a Great Depression, for example, then we turn to our government to offer assistance. And you're seeing this in the pandemic. You know, the private sector was shelved. I mean, and then all of a sudden, you know, any, anything with public money, then suddenly that started to boom. So you're seeing a real division now between private sector and public sector, which I believe is one of the fault lines that's not often talked about in economics and politics today. How, how do you mean? Because, like, um, you know, most of the time I've found myself uh, very much on the left side of this argument where, the, you know, the, the public money and – and and advocating for uh, graduated taxes amongst you know uh, elevated income earners and stuff like that, I've often found myself on that side of the argument. But you know, when I look at guys like Elon Musk, who have a very noble uh, uh, mission statement, where it's like we're going to make humanity multiplanetary in case something bad happens to either Mars or Earth. You know, we're going to have. Uh, a, a place to restart from and this is his you know his ultimate vision his ultimate goal and he puts a hundred percent of his income back towards the company back towards those rocket programs where he's trying to reach that specific mission i'm like well you know what that's not so bad so you know like how do we like so then I, now I, i'm thinking oh well maybe we need to reconsider how we look at you know maybe i maybe i was being too short with billionaires in general before you know um so I think you're right. I think I see the arguments differently now that maybe I'm a little bit older and I'm looking at things a little bit different. But I mean, what do you what do you mean? I like outside away from SpaceX besides SpaceX, what do you mean by fault lines? Well, the fault lines exist between public and private sector. I mean, mm. basically, on one side, the Trump side and, you know, let's just call that the Republican side. Uh, they believe in private industry. And, you know, it, let's be fair, inside that camp, you find, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, you find a lot of billionaires, you find a lot of innovators within that, within that camp. Let's just call that the private sector camp. And by the way, this is not always so, so clear cut Republican and Democrat. You sure. know, uh, there are sudden, certainly Democrats that are, that are also entrepreneurs as well. But, you know, yeah, the guy in the large, Democratic primary, I can't think of his name, uh, the Asian uh, guy. Uh, he was like uh, pro-math, pro-education. He was like a tech billionaire. A yen, maybe? I can't, I can't think of his name. He was, he was one of the Democratic primary candidates. Anyway, I'm sorry, I interrupted. Yeah, and, and on the other side, you have um, a more socialist system, like what you see in Europe. And while that is, you know, certainly, you know, fairer and you could say a more stable society, does it have the same innovation to it that a capitalist society does? Elon Musk does a great job of selling the dream, so to speak. I mean, he's a tremendous salesman. And, you know, Mars and, and his space exploration are fantastic long-term strategies. You know, it's, it, he's wanting, he's saying to us, let's keep our eye towards the long term here. And, and I think certainly the technologies that he'll, you know, he's helping to pioneer will be, you know, uh, advantageous for us now and in the near term future. So, you know, when they're when they're learning about space exploration, much of the science, much of the technology, new technology will be applied in many other areas as well. So, you know, this this whole you know, there, there are aspects of Trump's platform that I like, in a sense. I mean, I think that there's a, so? a pro-business. Well, there's a, I think there's this man is an entrepreneur and understands what, you know, what that entails. I mean, he spent most of his career in the business sector. Uh, and I think he has, uh, you know, more, more, let's say, more compassion for an investor on, along those lines. Whereas I think the left and, and Biden... Uh, they're more institutional. You know, for example, let's look at Pelosi and, you know, the stimulus deal that's been held up. One mm -hmm. of the major sticking points is, is money that goes to state and local governments. The Democrats, Pelosi in particular, wants more money for state and local governments, whereas the Republicans, and Trump in particular, wants more direct cash infusion to individuals. Sure. And I have to say that actually on this one point, I agree with Trump 
because I believe that it's better to make direct stimulus payments to individuals than, you know, to uh, boister up, uh, you know, you know, local governments. Right. And local I, local institutions that, you know, and that money just don't like sometimes it gets held up. It doesn't get used in the, uh, initially. It doesn't well, go to be, staples like food and water, you know, or bills. It's highly inefficient as well. I mean, you know. You know, it's like so. I mean, I understand the Republicans' frustration about this situation. I mean, you know, here in San Antonio, just go out and look at the road system. I mean, I live on, off the of days of Lala, mm -hmm. and they're constantly ripping it and redoing it and ripping it and redoing it. And you just think this is just about these guys getting paid. That's yeah, basically. I've been over there. I've I mean, been over there recently, and I saw all the all the work uh, down Desavala, and it's just. It's all Same. over the city, Joel. It's all over. And so there's obviously an infusion of capital that they're trying to hire people. And, okay, but what, how inefficient is this? It's the inefficiency of – and that's where I, I believe that the Tea Party and the Republicans have it right. You know, the private industry, what it does best is efficiency. What it does worst is equality. It doesn't sure. always – it's not always an equal thing. Which is but which is good that we have that double system, though, right? Because one tempers the other. Yes, yes, yes. That's exactly right. But see, now we're seeing a big, big swing in this, and that is that private sector has taken a major hit. I mean, have you seen the foreclosures and the the, the going out of business? I mean, Steinmart up the street is out of business, right? Yeah. The Starbucks over where where nearly went out of business. So I mean, a lot of these smaller I mean, Starbucks is, you know, a huge outfit. I'm surprised that they closed that. But a lot of these medium-sized local businesses are going under. And so that's a real – that's going to be a real problem because how long is it going to take to restart all of that? Once the damage is done, once they're bankrupt, once they're out of business, it's – you know those individuals, the employees. You know they they got to go somewhere. How much of that? Is, how much of that do you think is attributable to coronavirus versus the already topping stop stock market that we saw before coronavirus hit? I mean, we were expecting a, a, a top analysts were expecting a pullback, a major pullback in the market right before right. coronavirus hit, and then this hit, and so it kind of it was like it was almost like a like a. A fault line to use uh, your vocabulary, and then this just kind of exacerbated it or, or brought it on. So, how much do you think that's coronavirus, and then just the system we had in place initially? Well, the big question is: is that you know, once we have a vaccine for the virus and it becomes contained <clears throat> and controllable, how quickly will the economy bounce back? And I think that has a lot to do with with investors' appetite for risk. How much risk are they willing to take? But even if there's the capital and the willingness to do that, there's there's going to be a rebuilding process that will take longer. You know, Joel, it's always much quicker to destroy something than it is to build it. You're right. You know, it's, You're much, right. E it's much easier for a business to go bankrupt than it actually is to, you know, that can happen in a matter of months. But the building of that business can take decades. Yeah. So, you know, I'm I'm hoping that, you know, the stalemate that we're seeing with stimulus can can get resolved because it could be catastrophic as far as medium sized business and local businesses. We'll just be left with H E B and Walmart. Right. Yeah, there know, won't be any you know, any mom and pops and, will be gone. Yeah. I mean you'll find a few like Whataburger and Bill Millers and, and the rest of them who don't have access to that kind of capital, they're gonna go under. You know, and what are going to happen to those people? See, here's my kind of take on it, is that I believe the Democrats have the, the moral authority. You know, we care. We care about people, and we want to see, you know, people do well. We're anti-war. We're, we're pro-people. Whereas I think the Republicans, they understand numbers better. They understand the business cycle better. Right. Better it's more cerebral. Money. It's right. more, yeah, more cerebral. Yeah, maybe, but not maybe not as compassionate, but more cerebral for right. sure. Right. We need both of them. We need both of them. So my fear is that you know I'm kind of a middle of the rotor in many ways. In many ways, you know, it's like I, I defer to the Republicans when it comes to business, and then I and then I defer to the Democrats when they talk about social issues. I mean, would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I'm familiar with the dichotomy. You know what I mean? I love putting stuff in dichotomies because it just makes it so much easier to uh, 
to understand. Sometimes I think that can be uh, a little short-sighted or like, like an oversimplification. And many times, you know, I mean, you could go back and forth all day long about whether something is oversimplified or not. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I like the dichotomy uh, thing where it's like, okay, well, you know, these people tend to agree with this set of circumstances and rules, et cetera, and vice versa on this side. They tend to be uh, pitted against each other in many, in many cases because it's like a binary choice. And so, yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, you, uh, you're just not interested in politics in general. You're also involved, right, in, in a, an organization. Yes, it's something that I've been doing for the last, well, since early voting, and that is play for the vote. You can find them online. And uh, my, because you're, one of my mentors... Be, I'm sorry, go ahead. Play for the vote. And uh, I play the cello and I, and I make music. So what I've been doing is heading over to the poll sites, various poll sites, and playing for the people standing in line. And I wow. found that it's a fantastic way of bringing a certain comfort and peace to the people standing there that can be a potentially, uh, you know, difficult situation. So, uh, you know, I don't, I, in that situation, I don't get involved in politics. I'm not, I'm not taking a side in that situation. I'm just bringing, trying to bring people together with music. And it's been a, a really incredible response. The, uh, the organization that I'm part of, that I'm part of organizing, uh, is playing in 47 states, in, including the District of Columbia, and uh, we've been we've been playing all through the early voting stage, and we'll again on on Tuesday we'll be out there playing in force uh, to bring music to people, and it's been a, a fantastic way of networking as well because I've got to meet my neighbors, and uh, you know so I think I got a few gigs and students out of it as well, so it's been a win win on many levels. Wow. You know, I couldn't help but think when you were explaining that to me about the Titanic and not to put like kind of like an end of the world spin on on the election. Although, you know, for some people, for some people, it might be, you know, but let's <laughs> let's be realistic about it. The but Titanic. <laughs> well, you know, we might we might play that. I mean, we're most people have been playing music that's um, soothing and, and kind of comforting. So in that way, yes, I mean, you know, we're trying to bring comfort in these moments. I really. I don't expect that the United States will go down like the Titanic. I no, mean, I, I just, I just meant, you know, it's a, it's a leaky boat and there you are keeping everybody calm on the cello. <laughs> I, I couldn't help but think about Leonardo DiCaprio running past you <laughs> or something. Right. Yeah. Well, there is, there is, there is more panic than there's ever been. And the, the, the numbers that I have seen have been just astronomical. Uh, I think, there's been more people cast their votes in early voting than voted in all of 16 uh, in 2016. So we're seeing massive turnout in, in uh, at least yeah. the, the polling centers, you know, people standing in line for two hours to vote. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when we went, we went on the first day, my wife and I, and we were there for three hours, uh, three, four hours. It was, I mean, it was impressive. And, and, and the last time, cause I don't recall seeing that, during the Trump election, but I, but we did see that when Obama won the first and the second time, maybe, maybe more the first time, but this se felt a lot more like, you know, Obama, Obama's first term election. It, it, has, right. it felt like that there's that level of participation. So it's going to be interesting, man. We'll see. We'll see. I guess today's the last day of voting here in Texas, right? Today is the last day. And then Tuesday will be the final election. Yeah. The, uh, election day. Yeah, yeah. So it'll it'll be very. And we may not know the results for a while. It could take a while to tally it up. It could be a contest. There's one. There's one of three ways that this election can go. Biden can win. Trump can win. Or it could be a contested election. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I know, think I think Trump said that if Biden won, he was considering contesting it already. Right. I, he did say that. I heard that on NPR. I want to say like a couple of weeks. I suspect that the numbers will be so overwhelming that it, there won't be much of a doubt about this. Yeah. I think that it's not, you know, in Texas, it could be closer. But I think that when you look at the just the volume, I mean, that that's that's that bodes very well for the Democrats. Texas you know? is going to be an interesting case. I think 
I, I mean, I think Florida too, but it, based off of the uh, the number of votes so far and everything, I think Florida might go blue this year. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah I mean, it's you know, traditionally speaking, in politics, people vote their pocketbooks very often. You know, sure. like their, their own interest thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's like that old Bill Clinton said, it's it's the economy, stupid. So, I mean, <laughs> people are worse off than they were before as far as job security, as far as the security. I mean, most people blame Trump for the mismanagement of coronavirus and the fact that, you know, he may be a great businessman, but he doesn't understand the role of a politician. And and I think he's he's acted extremely recklessly going to the super spreader rallies of his and, you know, not requiring masks. And, you know, I think there actually there could be a, a more sinister intention here. If he spreads the virus around, then maybe they can delay the election. He's already asked for the, the election to be delayed, knowing that, you know, he's down in the polls and hoping the economy makes a rebound. Yeah, which was a 180 was, from what he was saying before. It's like, oh, we got to open it. We got to open it. Yeah. Right, right. Well, I think, you know, it's extremely self-serving. And, you know, po politics at its core should be about helping people. And I think that, you know, his, uh, you know, and you're looking at Pence now, the people within his administration or within his office are getting sick as well. So, you know, that, that old fashioned way of doing politics, you know, pressing the flesh and going out there and meeting people in person. I mean, it's, it's a dangerous, uh, it's a dangerous precedent. And, you know, it makes me sad that, you know, our politicians, Trump in particular, can't see that and can't understand that he's doing more harm than good. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Um, if if somebody wants somebody out there already plays violin or or cello or viol or something like that and and wants to join, I don't know if it's just restricted to to, to strings, but if somebody wants to join, uh, play uh, uh, for the vote, where would they go? Yes, Google play for the vote. Uh huh. And it is playforthevote.com, and you can sign up right there okay. in order to play. That's cool. Uh, and uh, it's a pretty simple process, and you can pr print out flyers. And uh, it's, a fan it's been a fantastic experience for me Yeah. Uh, to, to do that. You know, since the coronavirus came, it's like you know, I think a lot of musicians have been cooped up and haven't really had the opportunity to get out and play for a lot of people. You know, you look at the symphony, the San Antonio symphony, they're not playing till February. I mean, they're, they're off till February. And so they're going to have a reduced season. And this, this virus has really affected, you know, the, that industry, the, the entertainment industry. So this is, you know, playing for the vote. It's been an excellent way of just reconnecting with the audience and, and, and seeing, you know, reestablishing that connection with real people. Yeah. Um, let's, um, let's rag chew for a little bit, man. And for those of you who don't know what rag chewing is, it's, uh, it's what, what ham radio operators refer to as, uh, just kind of shooting the shit. Right. So, uh, absolutely. So tell me about your setup because I have a confession to make right after we spoke and I was like, who the hell is this guy? Cause I, I was listening to the two meter call frequency, for night to night to night, and I, I, I heard these two guys, you know, uh, right along the the stereotype that we're talking about, prepper guys, you know who I'm talking about, and uh, I was like, these guys are really full of their own ideas, and then, but I would still listen, you know, because I like to listen, and uh, and one night I heard you come on, and you were just sparring with them left and right. You were like, well, that's bullshit, and this is that, and it, it got heated, heated for ham radio because. There's a certain kind of gentlemanly etiquette that you have to abide by. And so you guys got as about as heated as you can get without breaking like uh, laws. And uh, and so I, I, so I started listening to you. And uh, and so I went and I looked looked you up on the uh, on the database because we have a database that that allows us to, to confirm contacts and stuff like that. And, uh, and so I, I, went, I looked you up and I, I think I went on Google to look at your setup and I saw you had a big, like a 10, it'll probably 10 meter. Cause I think you're a technician, big 10 meter antenna, uh, by, uh, outside your house. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. So I must be active on, I never listened to you on 10 meters, but we should talk about that. We should talk about like 
the two worlds of ham radio. You have like these point to point communications that often happen with VHF and UHF, but then you have this other world that's HF and these radios allow people to communicate all the way around the world under the right conditions without the use of a satellite or the internet. It was, it was chat rooms and internet before the internet existed. So tell me about your like 10 meter stuff. I, I'm assuming it's 10 meters. I don't know if you listen to something else. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, for a long time I had a, a, a 10 meter antenna and, and we would have what's called simplex conversations, uh, not using a repeater, not using a booster station in order to c communicate. And I felt it was an excellent way of, you know, my my interest in ham radio has always been more the local end of it, uh, which is the reason that I wasn't so interested in the, uh, you know, the general class licensing. Uh, you know, that's where the lion's share of HF is and, and you know, long-range communication. Uh, but for me, what was more interesting is community building within, uh, you know, within the San Antonio or Texas area. And, you know, 10 meters is more set up for that. I mean, you can certainly make long range communications on 10 meters and I have, but you know, most of my, most of my contacts have been stateside. Um, did you ever get involved in the local radio organizations like arrow and arrow yeah, and all I, that? I was a member of arrow and I think it's a, it's a wonderful thing to, to be part of that and to, to have that, you know, community, uh, you know, so, I mean, yes, I, and, and that aspect of it, I, I really like radio because you know, people will come together and they'll work towards a common goal, like, say, putting up a repeater or, you know, uh, you know, handling traffic or the weather nets and things along those lines. And I think those, those are really beautiful, beautiful things. Um, you know, where it gets really kind of tricky is when you get um, a lot of political discussion or you get a lot of, you know, personal statements. And so that, but that's part of ham radio too. Is you know, uh, you know, it's freedom of expression, and people can talk about what they want. Uh, so you know, it's like it's. I guess it's inevitable that there will be some disagreement about, you know, political things or social events, and and. How but we should talk about the differences between ham radio and the internet. On the internet, you can get on a on a YouTube video. You can look up. Uh, some some occur some political occurrence and and you can make an outrageous comment and tell somebody that they're a horrible piece of shit and that they should go jump off a cliff or something right but you can't necessarily do that and get away with it easily in the ham radio world why is that well I mean you can but you know you're less anonymous than you are on the internet I mean you know you, you know for for your listeners to know um, you know every operator has a call sign. And that call sign can be directly traced back to a physical address. So it's it's much simpler and easier for people to uh, you know to, to to hunt you down, so to speak, you know, to figure out who it is. So you know what that says to me is that you have to stand behind your words. So whatever it is that you say, you need to you know be able to you know fess up to that because it's harder to shake that. Now you know that said, I mean somebody could use somebody's call sign illegally so i mean that's not a full full move foolproof method as well but i guess the, the the big difference between the internet and ham radio is has to do with how much of it is anonymous and how much how much of it is known but we're, we're known stations uh you know we have call signs that are issued by the fcc right just like a radio station and and that you know using the fcc can you, people can get back to you in in, in another in other words right Trace you. Um, what about uh, like specialties? Because there's a lot of specialties in ham radio. It's not just two guys on a walkie-talkie. There are uh, 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 things you can do to communicate on satellites. Uh, like we mentioned, the HF stuff. There's uh, data communications where you can set up kind of like internet, like very simple internet connections over the radio. Um, people play around with bouncing their signal off the moon. There's a, did you ever mess with any of that specialty stuff? Yes, it's interesting. Right now, I am very interested in AM broadcast mm -hmm. because you know I think it's a an incredibly underutilized segment of of the of the bandwidth. So there's been a great deal of experimentation on my part for finding an AM broadcast middle wave antenna system 
uh-huh. that's also friendly to um, you know to uh, the the environment that we're in. And uh, you know there there is part of part of the FCC regulations is that you have the ability to, for anybody to broadcast at low levels of power, low power AM broadcast. Uh, and we're seeing more of that. You know, an example of that is uh, the talking house uh, transmitter, which is something that real estate agents have been using for years. Uh, it's a small transmitter that if you drive by a house in your car, that you can tune in to a certain frequency and listen to the particulars of that house sale. And that's something that's been well established in the law and is also open for, you know, other forms of communication, not just business, but other things as well. So to me, you know, when I look at this, I look at what value radio can offer and that local immediate contact with people is something that, you know, is very interesting. And then you you consider that AM radio, most cars, most automobiles are equipped with, still equipped with AM radio receivers. So, uh, you know, uh, it's it's a, a really fascinating field in which, the you know, the, the technique is already there to a large extent. I mean, there are small antennas available, you know, verticals, uh, but really implementing them and putting them into, uh, you know, various situations in the community, having community radio, I think can add a lot of value. You know, where you're seeing it re- taking a resurgence now is with, Houses of Worship, uh, you know, Coker Methodist, it's a church that I've been involved with uh, in the past. They are looking at a system of low low power FM and low power AM radio uh, during this pandemic situation, so they could have people still worship together, but still be safe within their car. Well, you say AM, it's it's kind of the same thing, kind of not. But um, on the shortwave bands, which there are AM transmissions, a little it's a little different. It's a little bit far off the AM dial in lay speak. But uh, but there's Brother Stair. There's like the the uh, backwoods, uh, you know, religious. Uh, I don't want to say fanatics and be disrespectful, but you know, uh, devoted uh, religious people that transmit on on am radio and uh but but the, the the you're talking about the broadcast frequencies right you're talking about 550 am to to 1700 am right exactly exactly that and the upper end of that band 1610 in particular has been allocated and i think 17 if i'm not mistaken uh have been allocated for low power am broadcast and they're highly underutilized but do so, you have you know, to have a broadcast license to use it, no, or it's it's no, allocated no. to hams? No, it's 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 open for anybody, uh, as long as the power and the radi- uh, the radiation pattern doesn't go beyond a certain point. But interestingly Interesting. enough, if you you know the the radios that are being produced now and put into automobiles are much more sensitive and sophisticated than they were ten, fifteen years ago, and can pick yeah. up weak signals very well so if you get height on your advantage you know if you get a height advantage as far as the the antenna goes um, even a very low power uh, system can work wonders and then if you combine that by having what I think what I call cell similar to cell towers then you can actually uh, you know broadcast to highly populated areas at low power and still get through um, you know, AM radio, as you as you said, is I mean, it's been mostly propagated and in, 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 you know used by uh, a, a smaller group or you know of people. It's something that I think has been underutilized. But going forward, you know, Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett has just invested heavily in AM and FM radios. So he also sees value in this as well. Yeah, anything anything uh, Berkshire touches. Basically, they have the Midas touch. Um, I I was I was thinking about when you were talking about AM about how I I heard in science class in middle school once they were talking about how you could sometimes hear Jupiter or the magnetic song of Jupiter on AM. And so I can't remember Jupiter or Saturn, but it was one of those. And I went and I looked it up, and I like 
I want to say I heard some weird stuff, but it wasn't until I got into SDR and like online software defined radio where I was able to kind of go in and with a spectrum analyzer on a computer, go and look at an AM band and then look for these quote unquote signals from Jupiter, right? And it's really interesting when you when you get an astronomical target on on those spectrum analyzers because we're used to seeing a signal come in and it's a straight line it's going straight down and has a lot of structure to it uh but when you listen to or watch that magnetic song from jupiter it's kind of wavy kind of comes in like a there's a almost like a fractal nature to the way it's waving because it's squiggly but then it's going on like this bigger squiggle and it makes you wonder if there isn't like a bigger Basically, the frequency of the song is is rising and falling at uh, throughout different time levels, and so you get this snake kind of thing on the on the spectrum analyzer. But I, I always I always thought that that was really cool. The SDR stuff, the bridge between uh, uh, ham radio as an older medium of communication and what people are doing with it now. You know, they're using those frequencies. Uh, and tying them into mesh networks and then they're you know they're build ba basically there's people out there building the internet uh on on ham radio on these older frequencies and there's the higher frequencies that that are are right up next to like the wi-fi frequencies where you can go in and set up your own little mesh networks and stuff like that that's really fascinating and i think that that's kind of where the where the future is with ham radio a lot of these newer hams that are coming on i think they're going to be like computer geeks big way and they're going to have that bridge that takes us into you know the internet as uh but i mean there's just so much like i, I have a, a buddy of mine and he's he's an it guy and so he was showing me some some uh 2.5 and 5 gigahertz uh bridges that they use you can see them like next to the uh next to the stoplights and the traffic lights if you look up at the traffic lights you see these little wi-fi antennas these square boxy wi-fi antenna looking thing and uh and those are 2.5 and 5 gigahertz transmitters and they're just basically sending the signal from the traffic light from one place to another but we we're talking about the feasibility of using those transmitters with solar panels uh with you know, RIDI or, you know, some kind of basic or uh, even I think there's some frequencies where you can even transmit like uh, 56K, like a 56K modem. And so that's where I kind of think the future is. And there's going to be uh, politics involved with that. You know, there's going to be frequency allocations that are going to have to be looked at down the road. And I think they've already started to change some of it. Uh, I haven't kept track with that. But yeah, man, that's super interesting. Did, did you ever mess with the Internet side of things? Yeah, I mean, packet radio uh, back in the day, I mean, did some of that as well. And, you know, it, you know, that's the beautiful thing about ham radio is you have the technical aspects of it, you know, that how it is that you accomplish a goal. And then you have the more social aspects, or I call it artistic aspects of it, which is really the quality of the, the communication between people and the value that we bring. Uh, within like AM radio, what you find is that the you know the a larger chunk of of the population are immigrants that uh, you know you're you know they they they'll listen to the radio they'll hear uh, music that they they like Conjunto Tejano um, Spanish speaking space stations for example they're they're becoming more uh, you know more prolific and you know it's adding value to people that wouldn't necessarily have access to the internet you know and and that's going to become a more sizable population as those that don't have that uh you know and you know outside of that what i see happening artistically and i think a trend that's that's happening is actually and i see this more within the arts is what i call hyper localism and what that is is that a certain area becomes a hot spot and and that that becomes the place quote unquote to be is that area and there's where i think you know you can find radio that really helps that situation let's say like a festival let's say for example you go to kerrville folk life festival mm -hmm. well you know a radio station there would be really pretty ideal actually you, you could have various venues 
being broadcast simultaneously on various frequencies. So people that say are in their car or, you know, um, you know, they want to tune, they want to go between various concerts, will be able to do so within that local um, area. So, you know, it comes back to, in my opinion, all of these technologies, Joel, need to do one important thing, and that is add value to human beings. Okay? Yeah. So that's, you know, there are, cer there are certain things that, in, you know, th these are the things that I like to invest in with my time and energy, are things that bring value to people. And the technology needs to always aid that, needs to get back to, you know. And, well, I think I, that's what that's makes where, it popular as well, right? I mean, it, if, it, if it's not helping people do stuff, then it's not going to get caught in viral swing, so to speak. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, um, the, other, the other aspect I love about, you know, radio is that, like, what you're doing right now is kind of a form of, of this is um, where you have call in where people will call in and you're going to get much more of, you know, a on, on the ground situation. You know, the problem with like cell phones, people think, well, you know, we don't need that because we have cell phones now. It's very difficult on a cell phone to put out an all points bulletin or general sure. announcements. Right. Sure. Uh, you know, like let, let's say if I break down, you know, my car breaks down on the side of the road and I wanted to call someone locally you know, uh, you could do that more easily, you know, with ham radio than you can with, you know, with with a, with a cell phone. So there's there's limitations within cell phones because it's mostly a person to person contact as opposed to an all points bulletin or general transmission that can that can be picked up locally. And there's also the technology redundancy thing, right? You know, like, I mean. Sometimes uh, you're going to have a bad signal or maybe there's a bad weather. You can't reach the person you're trying to call for help. Um, maybe there's infrastructure issues like in hurricanes, stuff like that. So there's, I, I, yeah, I totally get it. There's so many ways that that technology can fail you. And oftentimes Occ Occam's razor, you know, it's going to screw up right when you need it to work the most. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's, it, the redundancy or a fail-safe measure, a circuit breaker, or a fail-safe, you know, it offers that backup form of communication, and ham radio is famous for that. I mean, we, you know. How did you get your license? I'm sorry? How did you get your license, your ham radio license? Because we haven't said, and we should say, that it, it, to, to be a ham radio operator, to operate on these cool radios with these cool kind of unique uh, methods of operation, uh, you have to go get a license because a lot of the time you're using a radio that can scan across an entire band and maybe, you know, just a couple of megahertz to your left or to your right is like something you don't want to be screwing with, like an airplane or, you know, some kind of radar system. You're you're expected to act responsibly with this very powerful equipment. And so because of that and a lot of other reasons, you know, it's a licensed endeavor. You have to get your license from the government to operate. So how would somebody get a ham radio license? How did you get your ham radio? Well, it's something that started off with CB radio. When I was a kid, you know, I, I think I, I saw Smokey and the Bandit part two. Yes, I yeah. Thought, okay. I thought, okay, you know, I'm going to get me one of these. And I did. I think, uh, you know, uh, my, my dad's friend, he had uh, a, uh, uh, a CB radio in his car. So I remember sneaking out to his car one time and, you know, and, and playing with it, and to my amazement, you know, someone got back to me, and I thought it was absolute magic. It, there's another area, by the way, that I think is, you know, begging for a resurgence is, you know, two, you know, is uh, is uh, eleven eleven meters. eleven meters, yeah, CB CB yeah. radios, which I mean, is kind of like, like having a ham radio, but it's not licensed because those are fixed well, channels. I mean, you know that, as we both know, that that particular frequency it has, you know, advantages. Because it can go longer distances. I mean, you know, than you know, say two meters are, are you know, um, you know. The well, technically, four, four in the United States, you're only supposed to be putting out like what is it, like four watts on those frequencies, or something like that, two to four watts. You're only supposed to be going out a couple of miles. But there are these like rogue guys that will like put like this thousand kilowatt amp on their CB radio. And they go out nationwide, you know, and they're like, hey, you could always hear the sunset and sundown, which we should also say, like, is a uh, prime time for HF because, like, 
magical things are happening happening in the ionosphere. So sundown, sunset, you turn on triple nickel or you turn on one of these, you know, uh, CB ham radio stations or channels and you can hear these people just knocking off. It's basically what, what they did as kids, what we did as kids on mom or dad or grandpa's ham radio is we knocked off and I, it's, it's kind of beautiful. I think it's cool. I, 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 I'm glad that the FCC hasn't like clamped down on those guys. Well, you know, uh, judging from what I heard when I was younger and, and what I hear now, I mean, I, I think the traffic has fallen off on 11 meters. I mean, nobody's using CB anymore. I mean, it's become almost, you know, a, a, you know, I've tuned in a few times, you know, for my handset, and it's it's just crickets. You know, there's not a lot of, I guess there's some here and there, but I mean, m- I, ironically, most of the people that I hear on 11 meters right now are hands. Yeah, over oh, really? there. You know, do you ever do you ever listen to it on on the highway like when you're driving like to another town like do you ever like have you know 19 yeah, I mean I've had a scanner in my car at different times and and you will hear like truckers using it sure. and you know you hear a fair amount of Spanish so I mean you know and various you know you know various uh, transit you know uh, communications you know truck to truck for example sure but I mean outside of that I mean it's not like you know in the 70s and the 80s it's like most trucks were equipped, you know, I'm t- saying personal vehicles, trucks were equipped with ham- with, a, with a CB. It was considered cool. So you had a whole culture that had built up around that that really doesn't exist anymore. I think it, it could make a, re, a real resurgence again. You know, I could see millennials picking up on this and saying, hey, ham radio, this is the coolest thing since sliced bread. <laughs> I mean, or, CB, or CB radio because it doesn't require a license. I, I see, you know, I like that aspect of CB that it doesn't require a license because for me, you want that inclusion. The only way, you know, we were talking earlier about these two hams and how they're rebel rousers. Let's just call them that, right? And I think my frustration with this is that, you know, I believe that it's only through a dialogue that we can change hearts and minds and that we want to be talking to the other side. Because, you know, it could be that their their minds want to be changed, you know. I mean, they're kind of – in a funny way, they're looking for the pushback. They're looking for the resistance. They're looking for a barometer to someone to, to tell them that they're full of shit, right? But they're actually searching for that, and they don't get that within their their normal, you know, uh, melu because they're only – you know, there's a certain – you know, the beautiful thing about radio is that it's kind of random. It's kind of like you pick up and you know this feeling, you know, you get out, you get on the horn and you start talking and you think like, I don't know who I'm going to start talking to. So there's like a, like a luck of the draw there. And you get that, yes. potentially you get that much more with an unlicensed station than you would get with a licensed station. Oh, I know what you mean. I bumped into people on 11 meters before and it was like, oh, what are you doing here? It's yeah, it's like kind of like, and it's almost like, like, uh, like. Like seeing a friend that you hadn't seen in a long time, except you've never met this person before or never talked to this person. And there's like an instant camaraderie there. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean, man. It's, it's one of the most beautiful things about radio. It goes back to what you were saying about that people connection. It's all about connecting with Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And radio, see, the other thing about radio is that it, it, it favors the voice much more. And it's a more immediate form of conversation, like like similar to a telephone, you know. Uh, now we live in the age of text and everything like that. But I think there's a sizable, you know, portion of the population, a lot of musicians, for example, really love radio because it, it allows them to be creative within this structure that they're more accustomed to, which is a, a vocal uh, audio version of this. Uh, you know, it's, you know, like how many times have we looked at YouTube videos and you could almost just blank the screen because what you're going for is the, is the audio anyways. I mean, you know, a podcast, you know, it's like, yeah, it's nice to see the person, but you know, to me, it's really about the voice. Sure. It's really about what you hear and that kind of communication. And I, I think it's become actually the preferred method of learning now. I mean, think of Joel, think of this audio books. For example, sure, yeah. I mean, the sales of audiobooks will, at one point, outpace, you know, printed books, sure. or you know, the 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 word on 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 a screen. Podcasting, I mean, people, podcasting, and audiobooks is is the only really 
thing in terms of entertainment that I do on my phone. <laughs> yeah, that that and when I'm posting to social media for this. But yeah, apart from communication, you know, like fun entertainment stuff, it's all audiobooks and podcasts, definitely. Um with uh with uh, an hour on the clock and it being Halloween, I don't want to go out without discussing some of the creepier aspects of ham radio with you. And um, I don't know. I, I We didn't prep on this at all, but I don't know if you've listened to some of those creepier things on the shortwave bands. Uh, but maybe, maybe, you know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, I haven't, I haven't been active lately. Uh, why don't you, why don't you, uh, okay, let me, what's, yeah. what's been going on? No, well, I was just talking about uh, things that you encounter on shortwave radio, which is in that in that world of HF HF communications. But um, talking about number stations. Oh, okay. And uh, and and pirate radio, I think. So I, I don't know if you've ever heard like a creepy pirate radio station on shortwave where it's like, what the hell am I listening to? And it literally sounds that I've, I've heard some where it's like, you know, it sounds like it was meant to intentionally be scary. And even some of these number stations do. Have you, have you ever given those a, a listen? I have, I've, I've done that. I've, I have heard them in, uh, you know, I've heard various, uh, ideas on what those are. I mean, what do you and, think number stations are? Cause it, cause I think they're probably, they're probably some espionage, uh, form of communication, and and I've had people who are actually, you know, uh, in into that who understand more than I do say that's exactly what it is. Uh, I've heard uh, that you know, like uh, different organiza- alphabet organizations use the number stations in order to get information to spies in the field because it's a, you know it has a few things going for it. I mean, it's got distance. Uh, it's very hard to pinpoint the exact location of an HF station. You know, it's much easier to pinpoint the location of an FM because it's line of sight. But as we, you know, as we know, when you when you're talking about HF, it's really ideal because it's hard to actually figure out where this transmission is emanating from. Right, because it it it, it bounces off of the ionosphere so much. So a lot of the times, if you try to triangulate, you'll end up pointing your antennas at the sky when you're close, you know. But you're 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 still limited to a a larger area. Um, and you know, if you think about it, spies in the field, if they show up with a portable AM radio, no one really gives it a second thought. Right, because anybody has por- uh, anybody ha- can have a portable AM radio. Right. I've heard also conspiracy theorists say that, you know, that there's other, you know, uses for AM radio. I mean, for these number stations and communications from, uh, you know, you know, aliens or something along those lines. I mean, I, I don't really know. You know, it, it could be that all of it is true. You know, it could be that there's, you know, uh, you know, hidden in plain sight is, you know, things that we don't quite understand. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird. I, like I've I've had a personal interest in that stuff for a while. And so I'm always curious as to what other hams know about it, how interested they are in it. I, I, like I, I've listened to. There's a website called Priyom P R I Y O M dot org, and it will tell you because they they catalog kind of like the Enigma organization back in the day. They catalog all these number stations, and some of them run on a schedule, and so it'll tell you when the next scheduled one is going to come out. And it's got a link, and it takes you to an online SDR radio receiver where you can actually. Listen. Really cool stuff, but you. But yeah, you're right. You don't know what you're listening to. Oftentimes, it's like a computer-generated voice or a pre-recorded voice of a creepy little girl saying numbers. And so, there's a bunch of weird inconsistencies, and definitely like a cool rabbit hole to to dive down if you're sitting around in Halloween, scare the shit out of yourself. But yeah. Um, Anything else, man? Uh, is there anything that you wanted to uh, to bring up? I think we pretty much covered what we discussed. I think this has been a really good session. I mean, I, I really appreciate you know you taking the time and, and and putting this out there, and and uh, you know I look forward to chatting with you again. So thank you so much for the invite. Right on, man. Well, thank you for coming on. I really appreciated it. I w- I wanted to get somebody like on ham, you know, in the in the ham radio world on at some point because. 
I think uh, I just I, I think it's a beautiful art form and a hobby and everything else we discussed. And I couldn't think of a better person to have come on uh, than you. So uh, appreciate it, man. Well, uh, I'm going to be getting out of here. Any parting thoughts? No, I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm good. Thanks so much for, for, for this opportunity. All right, brother. Well, uh, have a good night and uh, I'll touch base with you in a little bit and a little afterwards and then I'll send you some links and stuff like that so you can consume the, the podcast. Okay. All right, brother. Cheers. All right. Thanks. All right. Bye. Bye bye. All right, guys. Uh, it's, uh, let's see, the 30th of October we went all over all that already I'm just trying to get us out of here because I donked up and I didn't do the outro well we'll skip the outro music for today uh thanks for listening uh my name is Joel Benavides you can reach me at uh squawk out or I'm sorry uh at Joel Benavides on Twitter and uh I'm at kf5uni on uh Instagram uh, and uh, we'll be uh, we'll be back probably in a week, uh, and we'll be talking to a local college station DJ or ex DJ um, Lisa Segovia, and so we'll uh, be talking to her about the broadcasting world, which is not they're more like uh, professional uh, radio operators as opposed to amateur radio operators. But I thought this was a good segue. I want to thank John Stewart again for coming on. Uh, he's a really cool dude and, uh, hopefully we'll have him back on soon. We'll see you guys later.